Hi, can I, good evening. I'm Kathleen Digri. I'm a professor here at the Neural, in Department of Neurology and Ophthalmology. And tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, when headache is an, an emergency, both good and bad. Uh, as you know, we've uh, videotaped these for many of our patients and people who are interested in these programs but can't travel to Salt Lake to see them. So we welcome the people who are here, uh, and we also welcome those of you that are online. Um, so I'm very happy to be interrupted if there are questions, please ask. But we're going to be talking a little bit about why somebody would go to the emergency room, what they can expect to happen in the emergency room, and then what do we use the emergency room for treatment of migraine, and how might we avoid the emergency room if, if possible. That's kind of the goal. So why would somebody go to the emergency room for a headache? Well. The important thing is that some headaches are really from serious causes, and I will go over some common serious causes. Fortunately, they're not the most common ones. Uh, and headache is really common. I mean, two million people visit the emergency room every year. Uh, it's more common than somebody going in for a cold or upper respiratory infection. In fact, it's the fourth most common reason for a visit to an emergency room. And then if you have migraines, sometimes you can have really debilitating symptoms like nausea and vomiting and become dehydrated. And, um, and sometimes there's inadequate treatment. And that's why people are going to the emergency room. Now, if you ask a patient why they went to the emergency room, this study showed us that the reason they went was they had the worst headache in their, their, of their lives, OK? In about half of the cases, if you ask the patient. About 33% 30, said their doctor said they should go to the emergency room because it, was a, it could be a serious problem. The other reasons are the patient's clinic was closed, or the office was closed, or they couldn't get an appointment, or they had no doctor or any place to go. And those were the common reasons that were given by patients about why they went to the emergency room. Now, let's set the stage of what happens when you go to the emergency room. Has anybody in this room ever had to go to the emergency room? Well, you know, it's a busy place, right? It's, it's noisy, and sometimes you wait in a waiting area, and sometimes you uh, get in right away, but most of the time you're waiting. There's usually a wait. When you do get seen, the first thing that's done is somebody will say, what are you in here for? And if you say, you know, a chest pain or a stroke, you're going to be whisked into one area. If you say headache, there may be a delay in what happens to you in the emergency room. But anyway, they will get vital signs, meaning your blood pressure and your heart rate. They'll ask about the headache history, about what's going on with a person's headache. And then they'll usually do a full general exam, uh, listening to heart and lungs, and then they should do a full neurologic examination to be sure that there's no weakness, numbness, tingling anywhere, or problem on the neurologic exam. They should look in the back of the eye because, as we'll talk about, some of the things that we can see are actually in the eye. And if you just look in the back of the eye, you can see what's going on with that patient. And then the most important thing they will do is review the history and the signs for red flags of a secondary headache disorder. So something seriously serious that needs to be treated immediately. Now the good in the emergency room is that they're really good at making secondary headache diagnoses most of the time. The bad is it's a lengthy evaluation, it's often a crowded emergency room, and sometimes pre people present with confusing <coughs> symptoms that they have or confusing signs and, uh, or confusing causes that make it difficult. Now what are the red flags that, you have, that they're going to be looking for? The one that the patient said was the worst headache of one's life, but this is a sudden onset of the worst headache of your life. Uh, this, this, is, this buzzword is really important because it usually signals to the emergency room doctor that this could be a very serious cause. And I'll tell you all the things that can do that. 
a change in the typical headache or aura. So somebody who's had an aura for hours and hours and hours, or the headache is completely different than somebody's ever experienced before, uh, that may be a red flag. Headaches that come on with coughing, sneezing, or a Valsalva maneuver, you know, like you have a bowel movement, those are typically headaches that could be caused by something else. Somebody who's had changes in their vision or visual loss could signal something else. Headaches in an older person, somebody over 50, 60, 70 having their headache for the first time, that definitely is a red flag that there's something else going on. Anyone with a headache who has underlying cancer, uh, HIV infection, you know, immune deficiency disorder, any type of infection, a serious systemic condition um, or immunosuppression, anybody with fever or stiff neck and a new headache deserves further evaluation. Anyone with altered mental status, like they're confused or they're out of it or they've passed out uh, or they've had a seizure and a headache, those are very serious and have to be evaluated. Uh, women who are pregnant or in the postpartum state who have a sudden new headache that's unusual or persistent, this de deserves further evaluation. And anybody who in that evaluation time period where they were evaluating what was going on with the, with the headache uh, and an abnormal neurologic examination. Now, the tests that are done in the emergency room, I, I wanna go over what they do in the emergency room when there are red flags, because uh, if there are red flags, there are things that they have to do. One thing they may do is do a drug screen and ask about amphetamines, alcohol, cocaine, even energy drinks can produce really severe sudden onset of headaches and cause a condition called a, a vasoconstriction syndrome. For sure, if somebody has a red flag, they're gonna get an imaging study. And most of the time, that imaging study is a CAT scan. Now, this is mostly done to look for blood or bleeding in the brain or a stroke in the brain. In my field, in migraine field, it gives us very little information, but most of the time in the emergency room, that is what done is done. MR is usually more helpful, but in the emergency room, a CAT scan is usually done. Sometimes they'll do uh, imaging of the blood vessels, like of the arteries or the veins, to look for like venous sinus thrombosis, which can cause bad headaches or seizures. Uh, anybody older is going to get a CBC and a SED rate to look for something like giant cell arteritis. The ER might do a lumbar puncture to look for high pressure or low pressure problems or to look for meningitis. So what I'm gonna t cover here now are some common, serious, life-threatening causes of headache. Fortunately, these are very small number. Most of the people who come to the emergency room are not gonna have one of these, but these are the ones that the doctors are looking for when they evaluate in the emergency room. So the sudden onset of the worst headache of one's life, they look for an aneurysm, headaches with fever, they're looking for meningitis, uh, headaches with a seizure, they're gonna look for brain tumor, uh, increased pressure, decreased pressure. I'll talk about each one of these and arterial dissection. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these problems. So subarachnoid hemorrhage. So th this is a serious headache problem and usually a sentinel bleed occurs. And when that bleed occurs, it's an explosive headache, sudden onset of the worst headache of one's life. And, um, and this is a headache emergency because if there's blood, and sometimes it can be subtle blood, like in this picture, that little dot there in the center of the, and for our people at home, you may not be able to see it, but there's a little speck of white right in the middle of this person's brain, and that's actually blood. And that was the sentinel bleed of this person. Uh, sometimes people have to go on to do a lumbar puncture to see if there's blood in the spinal fluid and uh, sometimes there can be stroke associated with it, and you can have death with this. I mean, um, people die. They get the sentinel bleed, and if it's not recognized early enough, they get the next bleed, and then they die. So this is a very serious, life-threatening headache, 
And this is what every emergency room doc is trained all the time to look for. But there are many other causes of the sudden onset of the worst headache of your life. Uh, sometimes stroke can present this way. Some people who have had a fall and get blood on their brain, like a subdural hemorrhage, this can present like this. Um, people who clot off their vein, the dr vein that drains the blood out of your brain, can present with a very sudden onset of a headache. A pituitary tumor that can sit in the brain can suddenly bleed and cause visual loss and severe, uh, uh, severe headache, the worst headache of one's life. And uh, a, 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 a not uncommon, or it's, but it's not rare, but it's not common, but it's not rare, is this uh, reversible vasculopathy that can come from cocaine use, sympathomimetics, uh, things that you use for, you know, spraying up your nose, those that they have little, like, neosinephrine in it and things like that. Energy drinks. Um, and people who drink a lot of energy drinks can sometimes get this. And then there are some drugs that can cover it. And there's a whole list of drugs that can cause it. But it, it's a thunderclap onset of a headache, and you, can, you sometimes have to do more studies to see this problem. Carotid dissection, um, where the, the artery gets a kind of a tear in it, and I'll show you a case of that. Uh, people who've got hyper, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, and then there are all kinds of other things. There is a benign cause. This is called orgasmic headache. These are usually middle-aged men who get a thunderclap onset of a headache. They get worked up for all these things and nothing is found and it occurred in orgasm and, uh, and it's a benign, uh, th what we call benign thunderclap headache, but it has to be worked up because you don't just diagnose that all of a sudden. You have to be sure that it's not another problem. Now, if somebody comes to the emergency room with a headache and fever, we're always thinking meningitis, okay? Because meningitis is another very deadly cause of a headache. Sometimes there's neck stiffness. Sometimes you can see these little changes in the eye, like these little spots in the eye. Um, and it's a very common cause of a new daily persistent headache, especially if somebody had sort of a flu-like illness with a new onset of a headache. And the way we make the diagnosis is with a lumbar puncture where they put a needle in the spine, take out the fluid, and look at it underneath the microscope. Some of them are treated with antibiotics. Some of them can be caused by viruses, uh, and those we don't always treat So uh, because there's no treatment for some of those. So again, this is one of those findings that we uh, look for. Um, now this was a woman who came to the emergency room because she had continuous pinwheels in her, her visual field to the right. So she had this weird visual thing. She had a headache too that was brand new. And then these visual phenomena that went on and on and on and on. And uh, she came to the emergency room. They did a CAT scan and they found this tumor. Oops, let's go back to this. Um, I'll use my little arrow here. Uh, to point the, yeah, on the brain to your right side, but it was really on her left side, she had these, this tumor with swelling. And she, this was the presentation of a metastatic colon cancer that she had. So you can see how the ER doctor has to listen to the history and then get those red flags and then do the test to make the right diagnosis. So brain tumors are usually new headaches, somebody who's never had headaches before. Sometimes they can awaken people in the middle of the night. Sometimes they have projectile vomiting, meaning that it's big vomiting, not just little retching vomiting. The most common presentation for a brain tumor is a seizure. Uh, and you all know what a seizure is, you know, where you can have changes in consciousness and jerking uh, movements. We always look for papilledema or swelling behind the eye because sometimes you can see that on the examination. And sometimes coughing, sneezing can be a sign of this kind of headache. If the imaging is normal, we often will do a lumbar puncture and look for high pressure because it can look identical without any, let's say the scan is completely normal, but they've got swelling in their eye, they can have high pressure. That syndrome is called idiopathic intracranial hypertension 
or pseudotumor cerebri. It's as common as multiple sclerosis in obese women. Papilledema can be subtle. There can be noises in the head, and uh, the way the uh, emergency room would make a diagnosis here is get a scan, make sure that's normal, then do a lumbar puncture, uh, and see elevated pressure on examine on the lumbar pun puncture. And that's how you make that diagnosis. Low pressure can also give you a brand new headache. Can be very severe. It's characteristically worse when you're upright and better when you're lying down. Uh, and while the most common cause is somebody who's had a lumbar puncture, um, it can happen spontaneously, just out of the blue, especially if you've had an injury or something like that. But it's a, ca a cause of very severe chronic daily new headaches that need to be evaluated. Now this was a 70-year-old man who was out shoveling snow, and he had the sudden onset of a headache but you can see in his picture on his left side he's got a droopy eyelid and a small pupil. And that should signal to the emergency room doctor that he's got what's called a Horner sy syndrome and this is a carotid artery dissection until proven otherwise. In other words, somehow he got a little tear in his carotid artery and this can be dangerous because you can get a stroke with this dissection. And an astute ER physician ordered an MRI scan where uh, this arrow is pointing to where that clot was around the carotid artery. The normal one is over here. It's just a black hole. On, the, on this left side, your right side, there's kind of a half moon shape of a carotid artery dissection. And he went on to get an angi angiogram which showed this typical narrowing. And these are things that have to be done to make the right diagnosis. So those are common secondary headaches. But do you see this little pie, this, this little wedge of pie? It's small. Those secondary causes are small. Most of the time when people go to the emergency room, it's going to be a primary headache disorder. Migraine, tension type, something like that, okay? So it's not going to be uh, a, it's, and it's usually migraine or a cluster headache. And I'll go through the characteristics of those headaches, so that what an ER doctor is looking for for those characteristics. Those secondary causes, praise the Lord, they're not very frequent, but that's what we got the emergency room for is to make sure that we don't have one of those serious, life-threatening uh, uh, disorders. Any question about the secondary headaches in the room here? Okay, so now I'm going to, if there's no secondary headache, the most common reason for somebody going to the emergency room is going to be migraine, okay? And when the headache history is typical and the examination, complete examination is normal and there's no red flags, you don't need imaging in the emergency room because you don't find anything. You do a CAT scan. You just get radiation to your brain from a CAT scan. So you, if if the, there are no red flags, the examination is normal, the, it, the uh, story is typical, you don't need imaging, uh, okay, in the emergency room. So migraine people do use the emergency room two to five times more than people who don't have migraine. So if you've gone to the ER with a migraine, you're not alone. A lot of people have gone to the emergency room with a migraine. And of all the neurologic diagnoses in the ER, it's in the top three. Migraine is in the top three. Seizures are also in there and, and various other conditions. So migraine, of course, is usually with a family history. The person usually had car sickness as a child, usually had migraine starting during puberty, and then their headaches increased. And this little graph is their life course. Uh, this bottom graph is the life course. I don't know if you can see my pointer here. It's kind of hard to see. And I don't dare go too far from this. But so you can see that the migraine started at puberty in this person, in this woman. Uh, then she got married and then she got more headaches. And then she had kids and she got a lot of headaches. And, and fortunately, as she hit menopause, the headaches got a little bit better, 
Um, but then sometimes people's migraine go into aura without the headache component. And then she, her typical migraine is with light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, nausea and vomiting. That's migraine without aura. Now a confusing migraine in the emergency room is migraine with aura because sometimes auras can be complicated. They have the same story. They had a family history. They had car sickness as a kid maybe. They had headaches uh, off and on during their life. But the aura comes first. It's usually visual. And it usually starts like this aura was drawn by one of our family medicine doctors. It starts as little zigzaggy lines that are colored like prisms, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then the headache comes on. Sometimes the headache comes on during the aura, sometimes it comes after the aura, but that's a typical aura. But there's some really weird auras out there, like there can be hallucinations, like Alice in Wonderland effect, where people feel like they're looking at distorted body parts, like somebody's neck elongates. Remember Lewis Carroll, uh, Alice in Wonderland, the, 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 these distorted images? Or going to a fun house, have you ever gone to a fun house with those mirrors that make you look like you're either crazy or upside down or your body is weird or something like that? Well, auras can be like that. Some auras can be speech problems. For example, I don't know if you remember this uh, newscaster who had trouble with her speech delivering the news, and that was her aura to her migraine. But imagine you never had that before. That would be very scary, and you might go to the emergency room for that because you've never had trouble getting your words out or saying the words. And so that can be an aura as well. Sometimes auras are vertigo, spinning, vertigo, dizzy. Some of them are numbness of the face and mouth. Some of them are even double vision, unsteadiness. So you can have some pretty weird symptoms with aura. And, and these can be difficult for the emergency room to figure out. If you've had them before, you know, then it's not so much of a problem. But if you haven't ever had that before, you can see why somebody would go to the emergency room to try to understand what happened. But this, these are auras to migraine. Now, another group of people I've seen go to the emergency room are men who've ha and women who've had their first cluster headache. This is a severe headache on one side that comes on and it cycles in the spring and the fall, sometimes called the suicide headache because it's so severe and it can occur often in the middle of the night. It can last 40 to 60 minutes and then it has features where you get that droopy eyelid just like that guy I showed you shoveling snow uh, and a small pupil and could look like a, uh, a, a carotid dissection and sometimes those people come in for their first cluster headache they get it worked up with an MRI scan to look for that dissection or something else causing this very severe headache and, um, and so cluster headache is another reason I've seen people go to the emergency room it, uh, it's more frequent in men, but women can have it. And uh, the typical life story is it's usually in the young 20s. And you can see on this timeline, on the bottom graph here, uh, this guy was in the army and he started having his clusters. Then he had a little remission. Then he had a little prolonged cluster period. And then he had some prolonged stress. And then he really developed some clusters. And then he had episodic cluster that occurred and the, the time course and, and the headache is a pretty abrupt onset and then it's got all these autonomic features like tearing and runny nose and flushing and, and it's always on the same side, a small pupil, a droopy eyelid and then once the cluster is gone all that stuff can go away. Sometimes it lasts a little beyond that but you can see where somebody would go to the emergency room for something like that on their first time. Here's somebody with a cluster headache with that typical Horner syndrome, kind of the droopy eyelid and a small pupil. And that's a very common sign people look for at the onset of a cluster. But it can be the same sign that we see with that carotid artery dissection. So you can see it can be confusing. So why else would somebody go to the emergency room with a migraine besides unexplained symptoms? Well, if you have unexplained symptoms like new weakness, numbness, dizziness, your speech doesn't work, and you've never had this before, 
I mean, those are symptoms of the sign of a stroke. And we're taught, you know, brain is time, time is brain. We, we need to get people into the emergency room. And with new symptoms like that, I, and you've never had it before, I wouldn't fault anybody going to the emergency room for that because I worry about new onset weakness, new onset speech problem. And if you've just had regular migraines and you suddenly have something like this, you want to get this checked out. Now there is a kind of migraine called status migranosis, and um, we'll talk about that. Uh, but this is a migraine that goes on and on and on and on and on for days. It can go on for three days, four days. And if somebody has intractable vomiting with this, well, what's going to happen? They're going to be dehydrated and not be able to eat, not be able to drink and get very, very weak. And that's another reason people tend to go to the emergency room. Altered mental status should not generally, there are some exceptions, but very few, should not occur with a migraine. So somebody that is comatose with a migraine, that's not normal, okay? That's somebody that should go to the emergency room. Some people who who've taken their rescue medications and nothing is working and they're getting into this intractable state, many people go to the emergency room. And then sometimes people who've overused medicine like opiates, like you know hydrocodone, oxycodone, all those opiates can really create severe, severe headaches for some people. Uh, people who've overused Fioracet, for example, medication overuse can create really severe headaches that sometimes people go to the emergency room for. So now, the treatment of migraine in the ER, this is the good part. They can treat hydration. They can put an IV in and hydrate somebody who's had dehydration. They can stop the nausea with uh, IV medications to stop nausea, and they can treat pain with medications and they don't need to use opioids or opiate medications. The status migranosis is a diagnosis we make when the migraine is very typical to what they've had except it's way more severe and it's w lasting too long. Um, and they have a lot of debilitating symptoms like nausea or pain. And especially if it's been unremitting for 72 hours, for three days or more. That's what we call status migranosis. It just means the migraine is going on and on and on and on. And uh, those can be treated in the uh, emergency room. Now we're gonna talk about how to do battle with this angel of migraine in the emergency room. Here's, a, here's the angel of migraine that's just gone and just beat up this poor woman. And she's got a severe migraine and, and we'll say that she ends up going to the emergency room. So, so there's some guidelines out there for treatment of migraine in the emergency room. One of the guidelines is to make sure we got the right diagnosis. And I've talked about how that emergency group of providers has to really work at getting the right diagnosis because we don't want to miss one of those secondary deadly causes. But a stable pattern of migraine, somebody who's had migraine in the past, has migraine now, is likely to be migraine. Sometimes depression and anxiety can play a role in making that migraine sort of escalate and become worse and worse and worse. And sometimes people get so anxious that they, I've got to go to the, I've got to go to the emergency room. And, and we can talk a little bit about ways to treat that anxiety so it doesn't escalate to that. It's important that we educate about headache and treatment and expectation and also encourage the person who has migraine to participate in the care. And we'll talk about each, uh, each of these things. One of the things the emergency room is very good at is treating the nausea. They have many medications for nausea. IV metoclopramide is excellent. It can have side effects and so sometimes they combine it with diphenhydramine or Benadryl to avoid side effects, but it can make, that drug, the diphenhydramine or Benadryl makes people sleepy, but the metoclopramide can help with the nausea. And there's grade A evidence for uh, IV medications like prochlorpyrazine or compazine, IV. Very good medication in the emergency room. 
Promethazine is another one. Often hydroxazine is used. And ondansetron or Zofran is, can be given IV or sublingually. And then usually uh, the ER will hydrate the patient because often dehydration makes you feel terrible. Uh, so hydration is really important. Now treating the pain, the most important thing is that we want to get the nausea under control, then we go for the pain control. Now there are some non-specific medications that are used in the ER to treat the pain. Uh, Ketorolac or Tordol is a very common one used in most emergency rooms. Prochlorperazine or Compazine is also used for pain. And sometimes Chlorpromazine or Thorazine is used IV for pain. There are migraine specific drugs that can be given subcutaneously in a shot. Sumatriptan is a shot. It comes in six milligram shot. And then dihydroergotamine can be given IV intramuscularly so people could just get the, this shot for, and these are migraine specific drugs for pain. Now what about opioids? And um, opioids are used on occasion, uh, things like um, Tylenol with codeine, meperidine or Demerol, a methadone, um, and uh, others, many others. However, we try to avoid them because studies have shown, and we'll talk about this some more, th these people don't do very well with the opioids uh, on the long term. Um, so what is the problem with opiates? Number one, it, it, people who get opioids and use opioids in the emergency room have a more frequent use of the emergency room. They have more visits, and this has been shown in many, many studies, and their stays in the emergency room are actually longer. And frequently it leads to rebound. I have a patient who every time this man went into the ER, he got a shot of a narcotic. I think he had, I can't remember, hydromorphone or something like that. Or worse, morphine. Morphine causes vasodilation and can make the migraine even worse. But anyway, he got, and then he'd be off to the races for an entire month of intractable migraine. So avoiding narcotics is a really good idea. Also, there's the abuse potential. People who get on a lot of narcotics in the emergency room have a chance of having this opioid overuse syndrome. And oftentimes what we're treating with the opioids is the anxiety with the migraine and not the migraine itself. And then there's a trust issue that happens in the emergency room if, you, if people go in and say, you know, I want one of those Shots, it's a D word like Demerol, Dilaudid, something like that. Well, you know, immediately red flags go up in the emergency room. And then the poor person with migraine is being treated like they're a drug addict or something like that. And here they are just trying to get some help with their migraine. So we're going to talk about if you do go to the emergency room, what do you do? Um, there are many alternatives to opioids in the emergency room, like uh, some of the neuroleptics, like we talked about prochlorpyrazine, chlorpromazine, metoclopramide, dihydroergotamine, uh, and, and diphenhydramine or, Demer or uh, Benadryl. These are alternatives, and there are even more. Uh, Ketorolac we talked about. Uh, some people have used IV steroids, which are dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. Magnesium sulfate uh, has been used in the emergency room. IV Depakote or Depakon has been used in the emergency. IV Levtriacetam or Kepra. So there's a lot of treatments. And if you go in and say, I would like hydration, something for my nausea, and IV DHE, please, they're going to go, oh, you must have a migraine. Oh, I'm so sorry you're feeling this way. As opposed to the person who goes in and says, I would like a shot of Demerol. Do you know? This is the difference. And, and the ER docs, they're trained in this. And they look for people who are uh, overusing narcotics. So I, I want to urge everybody, it, uh, and that's going to be part of what we're going to talk about at the end, is have a plan. What's your plan? Now, sometimes people have to be admitted. And here's some guidelines that have come out on uh, if somebody has high frequency severe, severe migraines, and they've been using the emergency room two, three times in the last month. Sometimes these people should come into the hospital, get three to five days of IV DHE or some other treatments to break the migraine cycle. 
get IV fluids to help with the intractable vomiting and, uh, and, and the dehydration. And sometimes we have to admit people if we're not really sure if this is a migraine or there's some, uh, something else going on. Sometimes comorbid conditions can play a role, like I talked about the depression, the anxiety, um, and those can be treated. And sometimes people are addicted to narcotics and do require detoxification in the hospital. Some people are unable to care for themselves at home. They may need to get admitted for a period of time because they can't drive themselves to the ER. And or some people who have no social support, that may be some reason that they need to get treated in the hospital. We try to avoid hospitalization because again, it's a noisy place. There's a lot going on. There's lights and sounds and smells and beeping and all this kind of stuff, which is not good if you've got migraines. So let's talk about the bad about emergency. The noise, the lights, the smells. Anybody who's ever had a migraine that's gone to the emergency room is gonna tell you that it's like the last thing they ever wanna do, but sometimes they're desperate and they have to do that. Most ERs, as I said at the beginning, are very busy and unfortunately migraine gets the low, is the low totem pole. They're worried about the strokes, the heart attacks, the, you know, all this stuff, traumas, uh, et cetera. The really sad part about going to the ER with a migraine is only 25% are pain free after 48 hours. So some people think this is gonna be the magic thing to do. That study was done that showed 25% are, are only 25% are pain free after the ER visit. So it may not be the best way to go. I mean, there are, we've talked about ways, reasons for going to the ER. And then the ERs often worry about narcotic seekers and they do search records to see if people have had narcotics in the past. And uh, there are reporting systems that are available to phys physicians to find out if you've received narcotics in the past. Now, what is the alternative to going to the emergency room? This is where I think we should be spending more time is every person who has migraine needs a plan for when it's a disaster, you know? People are throwing up, whatever. So I say to all my patients, I want you to have a plan. Plan one, control nausea. And here you may need, besides oral nausea medicines, you may need a rectal suppository. Now, in the United States, we're not real suppository people. We don't like that kind of stuff. But the best thing is you don't have to put something else in your mouth, okay? And so having that as a rescue plan is not a bad idea. And they make lots of different types of anti-nausea suppositories, promethazine or phenergan, prochlorpyrazine or compazine, um, uh, tigan. I mean, there's bunches and bunches of these nausea um, um, suppositories. Then, if the pain hasn't responded to your usual medications, then sleep usually works. So I always say, stop the nausea, control the pain if you can, when all else fails, sleep because sleep usually breaks a migraine cycle. And half the time when you go into the emergency room, what do they give you? They give you something that's gonna knock you out and put you to sleep. So you can have some things that can put you to sleep at home. For example, um, Benadryl, diphenhydramine. Sometimes your doctor or provider can give you other sleeping medications that are pretty safe, that could be putting you to sleep for a period of time to get rid of the migraine. You know, and if you have these alternatives, you can take care of yourself. Another thing that we have started here at the University of Utah are, is an infusion center here in our clinic. We have a room with lights out, and you have to be a patient that we've seen, that we know and, and have seen before, that has a diagnosis, that has a plan. And we try to have a plan, a rescue plan, for every single patient if you need it. The infusion center is open during business hours. The bad part is it's only open kind of eight to three to four in the afternoon and you have to come during that time. But we have a plan and every patient that we see gets sent home with kind of a plan of what to do. Um, yes? If it's outside of the well, we can't do the infusion here. 
then it's the emergency room, unfortunately. Do you know what I mean? That's the bad part. And we divide, yes? That can be done, but that's difficult because you have to order home health, uh, and that takes time and effort. I mean, it, uh, that's a problem. So um, we can we can talk though about uh, you know some things that people can try, you know, like the subcutaneous sumatriptan. That could be done at home. You know, if you if you are a triptan user and you get a really bad intractable headache you could use the shot of sumatriptan instead of just a pill of sumatriptan. And so these are treatments you can do at home. I am DHE, you could do at home with an anti-nausea medication. So there are some of these treatments that can be done at home. Now we divide in our infusion center, we divide, if you bring a driver, we'll give you something that'll make you sleepy. If you don't bring a driver and you're driving yourself, we're not giving you anything that's going to make you sleepy because we don't want you on the road causing trouble or trouble for yourself or others. So, you know, we don't give you any. So if there's no driver, we will often give the Zofran or Ondansetron uh, and Ketorolac or Toradol. And that, uh, it won't make you sleepy uh, and it'll stop the nausea and it usually helps with the pain. If, if you have a driver, we may add the Benadryl to it to help with the sleep. Uh, if severe nausea, we do have the ability to give IV fluids. Uh, we usually give a half a liter or a liter at the onset, and then we repeat the nausea medication, and then we may use Compazine or Benadryl or IV DHE. And we sometimes use F IV Depakon, sometimes we'll use an IV steroid, um, and sometimes we use a combination of these medications. But we try to pre select what treatments we would recommend. Some, some people we give them the whole menu. Some people will just give them a few things like let's say they're allergic to something or have had a dystonic reaction to something, then we're careful to use something that won't cause a trouble. Um, I did want to mention children um, going to the emergency room and this is sort of an algorithm that's uh, about children in the emergency room and at the top this box here says uh, they do the history and the exam, and the same red flags, you know, if they had previous migraines, uh, is this typical for their migraine, well then we just treat their migraine. If this is abnormal exam, or they've never had migraines before, then they may get an imaging procedure, a CT or an MR. So it's very similar to the adults, what they do. And then they usually do IV medication, uh, IV uh, fluids for people with migraine, they often use Ketorolac or the Toradol. They use IV metoclopramide or a little bit of IV uh, Compazine with a little bit of Benadryl and then observe and repeat if necessary and, um, and so forth. So kids get a similar pattern treatment uh, as adults and I know at Primary Children's here at, uh, um, on the university, by the university campus, uh, this is very similar to what they do in the emergency room here at uh, uh, Primary Children's. So here's my advice if you have to go to the ER. Number one, know your diagnosis. I have chronic migraine, with or without aura. I am on these medicines. And you may have to have a list printed out because when anybody who has migraine knows they can't think when they've got migraine. Their brain is all muddled up and confused. And so just have it all written down. This is my medicine list. These are the doses that I take. Here's the name of my provider. These are the new symptoms I have had that I've never had before. I just want somebody to check it out if that's the case. If it's this, I've been having this headache for three days, I can't get rid of it, I'm a disastrous mess. Ask for hydration. Just say, I want to be hydrated. Ask for a non-opiate treatment and find one that works for you. Get one that works for you. Because you will then not be treated as a drug seeker, but by be somebody who's had a bad migraine that needs help and say, please turn out the lights. If you look in the back of my eyes, use a green light so it doesn't make me puke or throw up. 
you know, because bright lights, if you've got migraine, it can make you more nauseated and make that headache so much. So use a green light when you examine me. And, and, but communicate with them ahead of time. You're going to find that they will work with you a lot easier. They'll say, okay, she's got, what's going to happen is the nurse will go out and say to the provider, she's got migraines. We've got her in a dark room. We've started an IV. We've started some liter of fluid. We're going to give her some something for her nausea, a little bit of Andansetron or, or maybe um, IV prochlorpyrazine or Compazine to stop that nausea, a little bit of Benadryl because she's got a ride, and then we'll give her some Ketorolec or we'll, we'll give her something to treat the migraine. And if the migraine is still there, they have steps that they can go further and further, and they can even call the neurologist down to the emergency room to help if they are still having problems breaking the migraine. Sometimes people have to be admitted to get rid of that headache. But if you, if you go in with this plan, it's going to go a whole lot better than if you just show up and say, oh, I need that D word, something or other, that's a shot that you know, then, then it, I can just tell you, you feel, ter you feel terrible because here you've got this bad migraine and then they're already suspicious about what's going on. Then notify your provider that you went to the emergency room because they need to know that maybe they've got to change your preventative because something's not working here. We got to get on preve a better preventative to keep people from going to the emergency room to prevent the headaches from occurring. And we've got all kinds of preventive therapies. And one of our, our broadcasts that we've done in one of our headache schools, we're just on all the new medications that are out for pre uh, prevention of migraine. So the job of the emergency room is to rule out the secondary cause. Most of the time it's migraine. They, uh, their job is usually to choose a non-opioid treatment. Now sometimes people do get opiates and that is appropriate, but, but most of the time we try to avoid them. Your job is to prevent your headaches as best as you can and work on prevention because you don't want to go to the emergency room. You don't want to go for a shot when you ha uh, have to. And you want your, you and your provider to work together to find the best combination and then have a rescue plan in place with your provider. Okay, what do I do if all the things you just gave me don't work? What am I going to do? And, th and then that, you should have a second plan. That plan should be I'm going to put you to sleep with this sleeping medicine. I'm going to give you a suppository for nausea. I'm, you know, just have a plan. Write the plan down too, because you can't remember when you're in the middle of a migraine what to do, and uh, somebody may need to think about that. Now, there's some great resources out there for everybody. I would highly recommend that you go to the American Migraine Foundation. Sign up. They have a great website. They have patient information. They have a monthly newsletter. They even have a big um, thing on uh, the, uh, migraine in the emergency room. They have a nice little write-up about going to the emergency room and what you should be thinking of. I've summarized a lot of the information that they have, but this is something that you can do. They even have a Facebook page called Move Against Migraine that you can uh, uh, meet other people who've had bad migraine. This is what their website looks at. Migraine is a disabling disease. Learn more, find help, and get connected. And um, the, it's a great uh, uh, resource for all patients in, um, cr really across the world with bad migraines. And this is their Facebook pages. Together we're as relentless as migraine. And, uh, and then uh, this is the world of migraine that, and the emergency room that I hope I took off your shoulders so that you know exactly what's going on. And with that, I'm going to open it up for uh, questions that you have, or if you've ex got experiences you want to share, or uh, problems you've had in the emergency room that um, have worried you or bothered you or uh, whatever. Anybody? <laughs> well, actually, they've, they've been very helpful to me. Good. So the ER has been helpful in understanding, um, and you have a diagnosis, you know your meds, you know your, do your provider. And I brought someone with me. And you bring somebody with you who can help. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, um, 
that's really encouraging that you've had a good experience because many people have not had that great of an experience. So that's encouraging. Yeah, they, they take care of you. They got the IV and very quickly got the meds going that, that you've talked about here and um, sent me home in much better shape. Not perfect, but better. Not perfect, but better. And then, and maybe uh, tonight you can even get a second rescue plan that you can do at home before going to the emergency room because there's these ideas that your provider can work on. Any other questions? Yeah. Doctor, you said uh, it's unlikely that the pain would be gone for more than 48 hours? Well, that was a study that was done that showed 25% of people with migraine that went into the emergency room only 25% had pain that was gone for more than 48 hours. So it, that's, the, that's the kind of the bad side. That's why I call this the good and the bad, you know. The good side is you probably get better right away, but the bad side is it may come back. And that's why you've got to work on prevention so that, you, you know, less likely to end in the emergency room because that, it's expensive and, it, and um, it's not easy for you or your family to go in. Um, that, but that's a study that was done. That's where I got that information, okay? And for some people, they can go in, get a shot, and be done, and you know, be on their way, and just do great for a long time. But for some people, that doesn't work. Okay, and I see that our uh, headache yoga person is here. If you're interested in staying for headache yoga, um, she's here to take you through headache yoga if you're interested. So thank you for joining us tonight. And um, if you have requests of what you'd like to hear in the future, we want to give people uh, information that they want. Online, we have a video library of all kinds of talks. So if you've missed some of the talks and discussions about sleep or whatever, we've got several uh, lectures uh, online. Yes? Is this talk available online? Yep. After tonight, it'll be available. They'll have it uh, put online, too. So um, you can look at it again if you want to. Uh, and because that's under the Headache School? Yes, under Headache School. And um, you just go, you can look at the archives. And we archive every single talk. It's all available for free on YouTube. So it's, it's there for everybody. OK? So thank you so much for coming.